Perfect. Excellent. Yes, so I have the daunting task to talk about gas and chemistry in discs in the 15 minutes. So obviously this will be, uh, well, maybe not obviously, there, this will be a couple of highlights that I find to be especially exciting, sort of what's going on right now. Uh, about half that I'll be presenting here, you can find in the longer talk, but about half are things that are a bit more either forward looking or looking a bit more at the theory rather than simply the observational uh, results, which is what I focused on in the longer, in the longer talk. The reason that I, have, um, I'm still going to mainly show uh, observational results is that discs, uh, and especially the gas and the chemistry, um, is really complex and difficult to model. And it's complex and difficult to model because it is so closely coupled both with one another. Uh, so the chemistry depends on the gas dynamics and perhaps vice versa. Uh, and also both of them are coupled to what the dust is doing and what the pebbles are doing. So trying to get, catch all the physics and chemistry in a single model is simply not possible right now, which means that you have to make choices and those choices have to be informed uh, by observations. So what, what does uh, this gas look like observationally? How does it compare to what pebbles and dust looks like? Also, this, these are images uh, of the distribution of gas and discs in the top row as traced by 12CO, our, the best tracer we have of what the gas is doing since we can't observe cold H2. And then the bottom row shows the same discs, uh, but in uh, dust or pebbles. And the main thing I want you to take away here is that the gas is much more extended. If you look at the scale in the top versus the lower panel, you'll see those are quite different. Uh, this makes sense because we think pebbles drift in towards the center. And the second thing is that the gas seems much smoother than the, than the dust or the pebbles do. But the gas is actually not completely without uh, rings or gaps. If you zoom in on this C observations and you remove sort of the smooth background uh, and you do a radial profile of the structure that you can see, you compare that with the dust, you will see gaps in CO as well, which then is in the, in the gas, uh, but they are fewer, they're shallower, um, and they're broader compared to the dust. How this uh, compares with models of planet formation is something that is currently uh, being heavily discussed, uh, uh, both I think within our team and with the, within the community at large. But I think an even more fundamental question is just how good of a tracer of gas CO really is. We have some disturbing uh, results when we look at uh, CO, the CO gas mass in discs at the global, at the global level. Uh, one is, what, which is what's shown, so these are just a bunch of discs. Um, and what's shown in the top panel here is the disc gas mass if CO uh, is tracing gas the way we think it does uh, in disks. And we see that most disks have uh, far less than one Jupiter mass of gas in them, which seems very little. And if we compare the gas mass infer inferred by CO observations to the dust, it's also, a, you get a very low ratio compared to what you think you would start with in disks, so with the ISM gas to dust uh, ratio. And is this because we are missing a lot of gas in this disk to get, get rid of the gas much quicker maybe than we thought? Or is this because CO actually does not trace the gas as well as we thought? We are leaning towards the latter. That is that CO, um, we might not understand C, the CO chemistry uh, as well as we thought in disks. Uh, there are ways that you can convert uh, CO into other molecules, which means that when you see a certain C, uh, amount of CO, converting that into a total gas mass, you might be off by an order of magnitude or two. And the observational um, sort of, uh, evidence for this is that one of the alternative ways of weighing uh, a disk or estimating the gas mass is using an, a molecular hydrogen isotopolog HD. And where we have those HD observations, uh, which are only two or three disks, uh, we do get that 
uh, the gas, these are actually pretty massive in gas and it, it seems really like we're missing CO. So one of the big things uh, looking forward uh, is figuring out uh, how to both how to use CO better uh, to trace gas masses. And to do that, we're gonna need better chemical models of how CO evolves in disks. And also if there are other molecules we can use together with CO to trace uh, the gas and to see what we have this missing carbon and oxygen in, in the disks. But the other that would be really awesome is if we could get more observations of this isotopologue on molecular hydrogen HD, but that would require another space mission, uh, another far infrared uh, space mission. With that, I'm gonna quickly switch over to another aspect of uh, gas in disks and how uh, that is especially important for, for planets. So of course the total amount of gas, the distribution of gas is important for planet formation. But another thing that is important is how uh, different molecules are, dis are distributed between gas and dust uh, in disks. And this is set radially by so-called snow lines uh, where you get the balance between condensation onto grains of a species like water and sublimation. So you go from having something like water, mainly in the vapor phase to mainly uh, in, the, in the ice phase. Uh, we think this is important for a couple of different reasons. There's evidence that you get more efficient plant formation uh, around these snow lines, especially around the water snow lines. Uh, we also uh, think that as you cross different snow lines, um, you will get a different composition, uh, chemical composition of both the gas and the dust. And that means that any planet that forms, you will need to, to know its composition you will need to know where it formed with respect to different uh, snow lines. Uh, so for example, close to a star, something like water is gonna freeze out, further out something like CO2, even further at something like CO, changing the composition of the solids and the gas that goes into forming a planet. This is true both at the molecular level, but also if you look at the elemental composition of gas and, and solids that goes into forming planets which is what's uh, illustrated here. Uh, so in these two uh, panels, you see what the carbon to oxygen ratio is as a function of radius in the disk and the nitrogen to oxygen ratio as a function of radius uh, in the disk. And the thin line is the gas, the thick line uh, is what's going on in the solids. And what you see is that as you cross each snow line where some species freezes out, you change the, these elemental ratios uh, the most obvious one is maybe the, the first, the water snow line, where you move a lot of oxygen from the gas into the solids and therefore chain, increase the carbon toxin ratio in the gas and decrease it uh, in the solids. So if you want to predict the elemental composition of, let's say, an exoplanet, uh, you're going to want to know where it formed with respect to these snow lines. And here, looking towards the future, I think what I'm the most excited about is first of all, what James, James Webb will tell us about exoplanets in terms of their carbon to oxygen ratio. So this is gonna be a great either validation or not uh, of this kind of idea of the importance of snow lines for planet compositions. But the other is to look in depth in our own solar system and especially at the icy bodies uh, that formed in the outer parts of our solar system and what their carbon to oxygen to nitrogen abundances are, as well as everything else we can think of as, as freezing out. For the final part uh, of this uh, sort of brief overview, I want to consider uh, what to do, uh, or like how you can predict planet compositions and maybe especially the delivery of organically in organic and other interesting molecules to terrestrial planets if the chemistry in the disk changes with time. And not only for, we, we want to know this both to understand where uh, our habitability came from, uh, but also, of course, to predict uh, the possible habitability of Earth-like uh, exoplanets. This turns out to be, uh, again, theoretically very difficult to do, uh, though there are attempts that are ongoing that are really exciting. It's difficult because the things that I talked about before, so these unknowns about how the gas and the dust interacts, uh, these snow lines, which uh, 
determine where you get a freeze out of different molecules versus not. Those are still all happening. But now on top of that, you have molecular transformations happening both in the gas and the dust. So some of the CO being converted into CO2 or methanol, for example. And this chemistry then um, interacts with the formation of pebbles. Uh, the composition might change as you turn the pebbles into planetesimals. And if you're interested in the composition of an Earth-like planet, you need to know both what went into forming the planet and then what was delivered uh, later on. One of the things to be aware of if you want to model this chemistry is that there are um, a few different regimes in the disks where you need to take into account of sort of different chemical, um, say, qualities. Uh, and that's uh, because you're sometimes going to be in thermal equilibrium and sometimes you're not. So I just want to briefly distinguish between three different regimes, which is if you're in thermal equilibrium, uh, if you're in a chemical steady state, or if the chemistry just, just continues to change over time. So what's shown here in this sketch is three different species, A, B, and C. They're all uh, com composed of the same atoms, but in different, uh, put together in different ways. And then there's the energy and the y-axis. So if you start, uh, with all your species in B in the middle, the energetically most favorable uh, transformation you would want to do is to go to A. That would put you in this energy well. But the easiest transformation to make is to go to C, where you have a smaller energy barrier uh, to get over there. So if you're in a hot and dense environment, you'll be able to access A, B, and C equally well. You'll be at thermal equilibrium. It's quite easy to calculate what the chemical composition is. But if it's cold, then you're probably not going to be able to get over this energy barrier that takes from B to A. And you're much more likely to just reach some sort of steady state where you go back and forth between B and C. And the former thermal equilibrium, you get an inner disk. Uh, this is sort of steady state where you can't access uh, some species you will typically see in the atmospheres of disks. And then finally, if you are in the mid plane or deeper layers of disks beyond 1 AU, well, then you may not ever get to a place where you're going sort of backward and forward at the same rates, and the chemistry just continues to change with time. And you can't really know the outcome of those kind of models unless you actually run them and stop them at the specific time. The other complication uh, with uh, modeling this chemistry is that disks um, don't emerge out of nowhere, either physically or chemically, but they is the last stage of the star formation process. And the different stages of star formation have their own chemistry. So you form water, methanol, more complex organics as you sort of process towards the disk stage. And these are all inherited by the disk. And then what we see is that in the disk itself, we see evidence of this inheritance, but also that you form new kinds of molecules, especially things that uh, have a nitrogen in, in them, so-called nitriles, which are actually prebiotically really exciting. So in the last minute, I just want to give you a glimpse of what we can do observationally to constrain uh, this, um, the, the distribution of molecules in disks. And ALMA is the star. Uh, right now. Of course, we are eager for James, James Webb to come, come along. But what Alma is already telling us is that whether we look within disks of different molecules, so that's what you see here, uh, one disk maps of five different molecules, we see this huge diversity in how these molecules are distributed. Uh, that means that the planets or comets uh, assembling at different disk uh, radii will have very different organic composition. Uh, we also see the same kind of diversity if we look at this single molecule, but now look at five different disks. That means that a comet that forms in at the same radius in around five different stars will also form with very different organic uh, compositions. And this is telling us that planets, though they generally seem to form in water and organic rich environments, they may still not all form, uh, form the same. And my final thought here is just thinking about the future, what would be really exciting to do? 
The first thing is just to get the statistics. We are really at the place where we have done most of the case studies on the chemistry in this disk so far, at least with ALMA. Um, but the other thing is uh, that James Webb is coming, which is going to give us much better access uh, to observations of chemistry in the inner disk. And I will go ahead and stop there. All right. Thank you very much, Karen. That was a really interesting talk. Um, we, we, we don't have a lot of time for talks uh, for questions because we are a little bit over time, but um, since we have a break coming after this, I'm going to give Karen uh, one question and then there's a whole bunch of them that you can answer online. Uh, but there was one question which was, um, how do you think we can link the, um, the sort of outcomes of planet formation to the sort of the studies of chemistry? that you're looking at, particularly with the ratios of different abundances. Are there particular models can we test? Can we sort of uh, identify different sort of uh, kinds of planetary systems to different sort of chemical sort of distributions and whatnot? I know it's a very open-ended question, but I thought you might have some insight there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things uh, is uh, elevated carbon to oxygen ratios in planets is something we mainly would expect if a planet formed beyond the water snow line. And, extreme carbon to oxygen ratios, you probably need to have formed even further out in a solar system. So if you see a planet that's sitting close to its star that has this very elevated carbon to oxygen and one day hopefully elevated nitrogen to oxygen, that would be a telltale sign of that where it's formed uh, further out. So that would be exciting to see if we can test that. And of course, if you find a planet um, that, is, that is currently sitting roughly where you think it formed, so further out, that one too should have these signatures, this, this elevated carbon to oxygen and nitrogen uh, to oxygen. So those are things to look for. And then within our own solar system, we might want to consider uh, doing um, much more detailed observations of comets that we think originated at different uh, radii in our solar system and test just how uh, well this kind of idea works. All right.